All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to this wonderful talk, Women of the Movement, from the Baltimore Museum of Industry, presented by Baltimore National Heritage Area. My name is Nancy Proctor. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at The Peel. Um, for today's online program, you can turn on captions, and there's also an ASL interpreter. The recording and the transcript of this talk will be available afterwards as well, um, both through the Baltimore Museum of Industry's YouTube channel and from the Peel's website. I'd like to add that accessibility is a core value at the Peel, so you will find all our programs ASL interpreted and captioned almost always. So please tell your friends, our aim is to be accessible to all. The Peel's mission is about amplifying and sharing the voices and stories that too often have been overlooked or intentionally erased from the historical record. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Peel in Baltimore stands on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of a number of indigenous peoples, including the Lenape and the Susquehannock. Our work is ongoing to better understand the pre-colonial history of our city and region, and also to support the indigenous peoples who are part of our communities today. I'd like to thank Ryan Coons and the Maryland State Arts Council for the references they have made available to us and to local leaders like Ashley Minner for ensuring that indigenous voices are heard and recognized in Baltimore today. You can pick up your copy of Reservation, East Baltimore's Historic American Indian Walking Tour Map from the Peel, and also download the Guide to Indigenous Baltimore app for free. Now, we have two big weekends uh, of events at the Peel, two openings this weekend, starting at 4 p.m. on Saturday. Um, both Solace, which is an exhibition facilitating conversations about how Black women care for themselves, and remembering the work of the Women's Coalition for Change exhibition will be opening. We're also proud to be hosting Catalepsis, the new immersive theater experience from Submersive Productions. We hope you can join us. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Kenyona Moore from the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Kenyona, thank you for once again bringing compelling and insightful presenters and programs to the Peel as part of your It's More Than History Lunchtime Lecture Series. Please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our It's More Than History Lecture Series. I'm Kenyona Moore, Outreach Manager for the Baltimore National Heritage Area. This encore lecture in partnership with the Baltimore Museum Industry and the Peel. This month, we are celebrating her story and contributions. Women of the Movement presented by Alex Ojeda Brown. Next month, we'll be presenting an interesting look at Baltimore's unique architecture and why Baltimore City owns so many historic buildings with Matthew Hankins, historic preservationist and Jackson Gilman Fellini, historic preservation officer for the city of Baltimore. Look for more information about BNHA on our website at explorebaltimore.org or engage us on social media, Instagram, be more NHA, Twitter at Beamer NHA, LinkedIn and Facebook, Baltimore National Heritage Area. Now I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Alex Ojeda Brown. We hope that you enjoy this presentation. Hello everyone. I am Alexis Ojeda Brown. I am the DEAI specialist and marketing specialist at the Baltimore Museum of Industry, uh, located off of Key Highway in Federal Hill. Uh, the Baltimore Museum of Industry is a museum all about work. Uh, and throughout my time working at the BMI, um, I've also been able to collaborate with other organizations as well. Uh, I am the previous program and education coordinator at the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum. Uh, I've done curriculum work with them about Baltimore City, uh, Baltimore City's civil rights history, uh, collaborated with the Pennsylvania Black Arts District with a curriculum for Baltimore City School students as well about preserving oral history and community history. And I'm currently the DEI coordinator at uh, the Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Uh, and through my time working with all of these different organizations, I've learned so much about Baltimore uh, and its history, specifically with the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum. Uh, I learned about how important Black women were in the civil rights movement uh, and how intertwined their, their mission was with 
industry um, and everything I learned working with them, working with Black Arts District and other organizations, uh, I've taken that information and I was really excited to figure out how it relates to the BMI. Uh, the BMI, historically, we don't have a lot of information on, on Black communities in, related, in relation to industry. Uh, and recently we've been doing our Reframing the Narrative project, doing gallery reflesh refreshes, so we can incorporate these histories now that have been overlooked in the museum uh, and rectifying that. And this, I want to talk a little bit about how this program came about. Originally, I picked four women, uh, but the more information, the more research I did about these women, I found so many more, and my list went from four to 14, uh, and I had to cut some down because there's no way I could talk about 14 women in this hour uh, and do them justice. Um, but I think that there's uh, power in knowing a name, uh, and you don't know what you don't know. So I do want to share some of the names of the women who unfortunately won't be in um, in this uh, presentation today. Uh, but first, I want to start off with a quote uh, by Victorine Q. Adams, and I pulled this quote uh, from from Ida Jones's book, Baltimore Civil Rights Leader Victorine Q. Adams. And Ida Jones is an archivist at Morgan State University, does fantastic work. Um, and Victorine Q. Adams was one of the original women I wanted to cover. She won't be covered today, but again, there's so many women. We have future programs to talk about how much they did. Um, so this quote is, the success that we enjoyed was not something that depended on one person. It was a united effort of many women who gave their time and their talent to the programs by which we were trying to move forward the community. These women also taught their children to help us get our program moving. I get a lot of credit for what many, many women have done. I want the people to know that I appreciate these women and I want to help other people to know about their contributions. Um, so here are some of the women that I wanted to highlight, uh, women of the Du Bois Circle and Progressive Women's Suffrage Club, like uh, Margaret Gregory Hawkins, um, Augusta T. Chisel. You have Sharon Langley, who was the first African-American child to ride on the carousel in the Gwen Oaks Amusement Park after we had large desegregation efforts. Uh, in the 60s, you have Dr. Helena Hicks. She was a student activist um, at Morgan State University who participated in the Reed's Drugstore sit-ins, the first recorded uh, sit-ins of the civil rights movement. You have Louise Kerr Hines who helped desegregate the Pratt Library's librarian training uh, uh, program. You have Anolia McMillan. She was the first woman president for the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And she also was the president of the Baltimore chapter after uh, Dr. Lily Carroll Jackson. You have Esther McCready. Uh, she helped desegregate the, the School of Nursing for the University of Maryland. And you have Verda Welcome, uh, the first Black woman to be elected to the, the state Senate. Uh, so these are just some women that I wanted to highlight that unfortunately won't be in this program today. Uh, but now you know their names and you can feel free to look them up and you know learn about their legacy as well. I also want to highlight some organizations that I relied heavily on for this research. Um, we have all of their logos here, but I'll go more in depth of how I use them. So first we have the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Uh, and for Maryland Center for History and Culture, uh, David Armenti, uh, I absolutely love David. He was very, very helpful with sending me photos, uh, links to oral histories. Uh, they have a great uh, exhibit that opened up, Passion and Purpose, all about the civil rights movement in Baltimore. Uh, and feel free to check out their digital collections. They are so much fun to go through. Um, you also have the Pratt Library Maryland newspaper archives. I lived in these archives uh, and they have all of the Maryland newspapers. I specifically would check out the Afro-American newspaper digital archives uh, for this. Um, so interesting and I think it's amazing that we have hundreds of years of journalism excellence at the, at, um, the end of our fingertips uh, through the internet. Then we have the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum. Uh, I absolutely love this museum. Please book a tour to visit. Uh, the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum doesn't have an expansive uh, online collection, but just being in the space of the museum itself, which was the former home of Dr. Jackson, um, was is, is super amazing. Then you have the Pennsylvania Black Arts District, the HPP archives. Uh, you can see we have Victory and Q Adams uh, picture collection over here, and they partner with Morgan State to get these. Um, uh, it's an online community archive, so if you ever have anything you want to donate about uh, the Black community in West Baltimore or about Pennsylvania Avenue, these are the people to talk to. 
And then I have to talk about Afro charities uh, and the Afro-American newspapers, and I'll talk a lot about them throughout this, but definitely check them out. Uh, this month on Afro charities on their Instagram, they posted pictures from their archives uh, and correlated it with a letter for every day uh, in March. And the photos that they have, the, the history that they've been able to preserve is, is amazing. And then last but certainly not least, Baltimore Heritage. Uh, I worked closely with uh, Baltimore Heritage Resources when I was doing my curriculum work, uh, and it's amazing. They have this Baltimore Civil Rights Heritage web webpage that I would encourage you all to check out. Um, it's, it was really, really helpful. Uh, so shout out to Johns Hopkins for that as well. Now we, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my, um, my video so I'm not distracting, but we're going to go ahead and get into it. So before I start uh, talking about the women themselves, I kind of just want to give some background information about Baltimore uh, and some background information about how our city looked like you know, um, before the civil rights movement, uh, before the Civil War. So Baltimore grew quickly in the late 18th and early 19th centuries uh, between 1790 and 1820. The city uh, almost doubled in population and continued to grow uh, throughout the 1800s. So you had both enslaved and free Black workers that were key to this early growth. Uh, and I do want to say, Maryland, we are the northernmost southern state. So we are a southern state right below the Mason-Dixon line. And we were a slave-holding state. The photo that you see right here uh, is a screenshot of Baltimore. Baltimore Heritage is basically mapping sites of the Baltimore slave trade. So you see the Inner Harbor and all of the tabs that you see represent places where the slave trade was active in the city. Uh, and you can go on their website and you can click the tabs and it'll give you more information about what that location was. Um, but because we were a large port city, a very active port city, um, the slave trade was, was prominent uh, throughout not only Baltimore, but the state of Maryland. So we had, uh, with the, being a port city, you also have heavy, heavy industry around the harbor. Uh, so you had uh, jobs like shipbuilding and repair uh, that African Americans would work in. Uh, also things like childcare, laundry, street maintenance. Uh, these were jobs that were readily available to the Black community. Uh, in Maryland, again, I mentioned it was a slave state, and we were a slave state with the highest free Black population. Uh, and most of that population in the state of Maryland was in Baltimore. Um, the rest of Maryland looked very, very different from Baltimore, I will say that, uh, especially on the Eastern Shore. So in the 1820s and 1830s, you have Black residents, both free and enslaved, um, and they were about one quarter of the city residents. And because their work was centered around the harbor, their communities were also concentrated there too. Black communities around the harbor and in areas of South Baltimore uh, formed their own institutions like churches, like Sharp Street Methodist Episcopal Church or the Bethel AME Church. Uh, and you had schools, uh, schools that came from these churches or even individuals who started their own schools in their homes. Uh, during this time, Black children could not attend the public schools Baltimore City opened uh, in, in 1826. So the Black community members took it upon themselves with their organizations to start their own schools. And again, while Maryland did have the highest free Black population in Baltimore, and Baltimore was considered a city where Black community could come and find opportunity, the city was not a representation of the rest of the state. Uh, and in other areas of Maryland, free Black people had limited privileges. And Baltimore still served as a slave port and had many of its own issues, too. Uh, today, we're talking about the civil rights, his the civil rights movement and women in the civil rights movement. Uh, people usually think about the civil rights movement as the, the 50s and 60s, uh, starting around when Brown versus Board of Education happened in uh, 1954 and then ending around 1968 with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, and while you see numerous civil rights legislation victories during this time, uh, it doesn't include the work that many people were doing pre-1954 and post-1968. So this woman will be, I mean, this presentation will be covering women uh, from various points in Baltimore's history. 
The first woman I want to talk about is Mother Mary Lang. And I just want to say that throughout the presentation, I'll be referring to all of these women by their first names, because uh, these are the names that belong to them and only them, whereas last names uh, they inherit from their husbands or they have multiple siblings that I'll be talking about or their children that also have their last name. So I will be honoring them by using their first name. So Mother Mary Lang was born Elizabeth Clarice Lang around 1789 to a pretty well-off family in Santiago de Cuba. Uh, her parents were originally from Haiti, uh, but because of her family's wealth, she was able to go to school and receive an education. And at the turn of the 19th century, you have a lot of French-speaking Caribbeans that were immigrating to the United States, and Lang was one of them. By 1813, Elizabeth Lang was living in Baltimore. She quickly saw the need for education amongst children in the Black community. I mentioned before, Baltimore City Public Schools didn't allow Black children, but there were no laws against teaching Black children. So Lang opened up a, opened up a school in her home to teach children of color. Uh, in 18. 28, Father James Hector Joubert approached Elizabeth Lang with the idea to found a school for the education of Black girls. Uh, with Father Joubert's assistance, uh, Elizabeth and two other Black women opened up the St. Francis School for Colored Girls, which is now known as St. Francis Academy, which became the first Black Catholic school in the Catholic Church in the U.S., and it is also the oldest continuously running predominantly Black Catholic high school in the U.S., and I have photos of it here. We have an older folder up photo up top of St. Francis Academy, and then we have two more recent ones. Um, a year later in 1829, uh, Elizabeth Lang, Mary Ballas, Rosenbogue, and Teresa Dutchman, and I apologize if I if I didn't pronounce their names correctly, but these women took their vows and the Oblate Sisters of Providence was founded. Uh, and they became the first congregation of African-American women uh, in the history of the Catholic Church. Elizabeth took the religious name of Mary and was the first superior general of the Oblate Sisters of Providence from 1829 to 1832, and then again from 1835 to 1841. The Oblate Sisters did more than just educate Black youth. They provided a home for orphans and widows. They nursed the elderly. They provided support for newly freed uh, enslaved persons, the freedmen, uh, and had vocational and career training. Uh, they also had night school for women, and the sisters also nursed the terminally ill during the cholera epidemic of 1832. In 1882, Mother Mary Lang passed away at the age of 98, which I think is phenomenal for the time that she was in, uh, and considering that she lived through a uh, you know, uh, epidemic. And in 1991, the process to have Mother Mary Lane canonized and recognized as a saint began. Uh, in 2006, she was declared a servant of God. And recently this year, uh, February of 2023, the documentation on the life of Mother Lane, which includes a uh, historical record of her life, theological record of her life, has been accepted by the Vatican, and she is now in the process of being declared venerable by the Pope. And this is, uh, I'm not Catholic, but I, I looked up this process, and that's basically two steps away from sainthood. So uh, I think that is so amazing that her legacy still continues, and uh, I am following uh, her process to obtaining sainthood very, very closely. The next woman I will be talking about is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And I will say that uh, this was the only name that I was familiar with, uh, you know, before I joined the, the museum world and the history world. This was one of the names that I learned growing up in elementary school, which I think is fascinating. Uh, and I will say, while everyone else on my list uh, mostly operates in Baltimore, does a lot of their work in Baltimore. Uh, Frances does not. Uh, she ends up doing a lot of her work in Philadelphia, but I'll talk about why that work happens there. So uh, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was born to a free uh, Black family in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1825. Uh, she lost her parents at three years old, unfortunately, but she was raised by her aunt and uncle, and she attended the Academy for Negro Youth in Baltimore, which was 
run by her uncle, Reverend Watkins, and he was also a very active abolitionist, and that kind of sets the foundation uh, for how she grows up. Uh, Frances furthered her education in her teen years while working for a Quaker bookseller, uh, where she had access to a variety of books and other forms of literature. In 1845, at age 20, she publishes Forest Leaves, her first book of poetry. Uh, and again, she's not the first Black woman to, to publish poetry, but uh, I think it's still very, very impressive, again, for the time she's in. The, this is still time where we have um, slavery. Uh, you have laws against African Americans being able to learn to read and write throughout the country. And the fact that she published this at 20, I think it's very impressive. Uh, in 1850, she moved to Ohio and became the first female in instructor in domestic science at Union Seminary, which later becomes Wilber Wilberforce University. Uh, in 1852, she moved to Pennsylvania and soon settled in Philadelphia. And this is where I talk about why um, her location matters and the historical context to it. And to talk about the historical context, we have to take it back a couple of years to the Nat Turner's Rebellion in Virginia. So after the 1831 revolt, uh, where we have over 50 white people murdered, um, Maryland, because of its close proximity to Virginia, was panicking uh, and passed numerous laws restricting what the Black community, both free and enslaved, could do in order to prevent future rebellions. Some laws would prevent, um, prevent Black Marylanders from owning firearms or buying things like gunpowder and alcohol. They had vagrancy laws that basically would try and enslave um, free Black people. And you also had the Fugitive Slave Act later on. And Maryland specifically had laws that uh, prohibited free Black people from moving to Maryland from another state or from returning to Maryland after taking a job elsewhere, or they would risk being captured and sold into slavery. Uh, so because she left the state of Maryland and was working in Ohio, uh, she could not come back uh, unless she would risk being sold into slavery. So she made Philadelphia her new home. Uh, and Frances homes in on her writing here, and she becomes with abolitionist groups uh, like the Anti-Slavery Society of Maine and starts uh, digging into her activism work. In 1858, at the age of 33 and before the US Civil War, uh, Frances refused to ride in the colored section of a segregated trolley car in Philadelphia. This is 100 years before Rosa Parks and Irene Morgan. Uh, and for Irene Morgan, we're going to talk about her a little later. Uh, but I thought that was just fascinating. Uh, again, a lot of the things that we see in the modern civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, uh, it, these types of protest tactics were being implemented 100 years before. Uh, so during a time where uh, Black people were denied an education and women were taught not to speak. Uh, Frances sustained a long and successful publishing career and was at the forefront of movements for abolition, public education, temperance, and voting rights. She travels around the country giving anti-slavery lectures and being an active participant on the Underground Railroad. In the fall of 1854, Harper traveled to 20 cities and gave more than 30 lectures, a very busy schedule. And that same year, she also published poems on miscellaneous subjects, which sold more than 10,000 copies. Again, very, very impressive career with how, uh, how much every she was doing. Um, in 1859, she became the first African-American woman to publish a short story, two offers, which was published by the Anglo-African, which was a part of of the Black press. Uh, Harper's writing became prolific through anti-slavery newspapers, and she gained a reputation as the mother of African-American journalism. And she continued to publish many collections of poetry, short stories, essays uh, throughout the rest of her life. And she passed away in Philadelphia in 1911. I wanted to continue on with the topic of journalism uh, and next talking about the, the Murphy family and specifically the matriarchs of the Murphy family. And you cannot talk about the print industry without talking about the Afro-American newspaper, uh, which is the longest running Black family owned newspaper in the country. And you can't talk about Black women change makers in Baltimore without talking about these women, 
who are part of the Murphy family. Just some background information, uh, in 1892, John Murphy Sr., who was a former enslaved Marylander, and he was also a veteran of the US colored troops that fought in the American Civil War, he founded the Afro-American newspaper. And as Baltimore's longest running family owned paper, the Afro served as a community hub. It hired black Baltimoreans who couldn't find work at other newspapers because of discrimination. In addition to publishing often underreported stories, the publishers fought for racial justice and worked to expose racism, not only in Baltimore, but throughout the country. Today, the staff at the Afro are still committed to covering stories and issues important to Black communities that are often ignored by other publications. Uh, and it's guided today by this generation of Murphy matriarchs, like Dr. Frances Tony Draper, who is the current CEO and publisher of the Afro-American newspaper. And she is the great granddaughter of the Afro founders. And then you have Savannah Wood, who is the executive director of Afro Charities and the great great granddaughter of the founders. And I have photos of them here. And I think it is so amazing looking at this older photo of you have John Murphy, uh, you have his wife Martha and their children, and then looking at uh, their descendants right next to them that is keeping this legacy alive. Uh, and I am a huge fan of uh, the Afro newspaper and of course of Afro Charities. All of that aside, I specifically want to focus on Martha Murphy, who is John's wife. Uh, and without her financial support, John Murphy would not have been able to start the Afro or it might've taken much longer. Uh, she supported not only her husband, but her community. So Martha Murphy was born enslaved in 1846 in Unity, Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, her family was able to buy their freedom and eventually buy the land that they had been enslaved on. Um, when Martha's father died, she inherited a portion of this land. Uh, she sold her portion to her brother uh, and two hundred dollars of the money that she earned from that sale. Uh, she gifted to her husband. John Murphy was then allowed uh, with that money to purchase the Afro name uh, for his newspaper and printing materials like a printing press. Uh, and with the help of the internet and inflation calculators, I did, I typed in what $200 back then would be around today, and that's about $6,700 today. In addition to helping found the Afro, Martha was active in the women's club movement, and she was a founding member of several women's organizations, but most notably the CYWCA. So in 1896, Martha and six other women, including her daughter, Frances Murphy, founded the Colored Young Women's Christian Association. And she served as president for about 17 years. Uh, Baltimore already had an existing YWCA, which was founded in 1883, but it only served white women. So the CYWCA focused on uh, serving the Black community, and they focused on housing, uh, food services, jobs, education, uh, and it was listed in the Green Book Motorist Guide. Preservation Maryland had a blog post about it. Um, Green Book Motorist Guide was this book that helped African Americans navigate traveling throughout Jim Crow United States, uh, knowing what places it was safe to go, what places served the Black community and Black owned businesses. Uh, and the CYWCA was in the Green Book. So if you were coming to Baltimore, you can connect with these women and they would help connect you to Black businesses and places to stay. Uh, Martha, along with other members of the CYWCA, like Ida R. Cummings, established the Colored Fresh Air and Empty Stocking Circle, uh, where the holiday season, they would fundraise, partner with local churches like the St. Mary's Episcopal, Episcopal, sorry, Episcopal Church and Union Baptist Church. Um, they provided uh, Christmas entertainment dinners and stockings full of clothes, shoes, candies, and toys to support and uplift Black children. Uh, these events often drew more than uh, a thousand people. Uh, the Fresh Air Circle also arranged trips that would provide an opportunity for children and women to experience life outside of the city limits in Baltimore. Again, Baltimore, uh, very industrialized during this time. And with heavy industry, you get pollution and dirt, um, loud noise, and just a lot is happening in the city uh, on top of the city already experiencing poverty and uh, Black community areas um, and segregation as well. So they would often schedule field trips uh, for, for children and their families to, to go. 
uh, explore the countryside. And one destination was Browns Grove, which was an African-American resort in Pasadena, Maryland. They had a picnic area, merry-go-round, uh, excursion boats and where you could ride on a new bill steamer uh, and check out the beach. Uh, and in August of 1907, uh, they were able to purchase 10 acres of land and they used this land to send children from the city uh, to experience the countryside, to experience a healthier environment. Um, uh, Martha died on February 6th in 1915 after being ill for a couple of months. And at the time of her death, she was 69 years old and still serving as the president of the CYWCA. Uh, next, I'm continuing on the, the Murphy legacy with Elizabeth Murphy Moss. Uh, she was the granddaughter of Martha Murphy and the daughter of Vashti Turley Murphy, who was one of the 22 founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, which is a historically black sorority that's a part of the National Panhellenic Council, also known as known as the Divine Nine. Uh, the sorority focused heavily on women's rights, racial uplift, education, civil rights advocacy, and is still very active today. Elizabeth was also a member of the sorority, and how could you not be when your mother is one of the founders? Uh, Elizabeth graduated from Douglas High School, and she studied journalism at the University of Minnesota, where she earned her bachelor's degree. Uh, it's not surprising that she became a journalist, given that she started her career at the Afro-American newspapers around age 10, helping sell and deliver newspapers like many of the Murphy children and grandchildren did growing up. In 1944, Elizabeth became the first Black woman to be a credited war correspondent during World War II. Uh, during World War II, you had more than 1 million African Americans serving in the U.S. military, and they were recruited to segregated units. Despite Black Americans having served in every American war, they were still othered and treated as second-class citizens. World War II provided African Americans with an opportunity to call out American hypocrisy while also showing the value of their community. And they did that with something called the Double V Campaign. The Double V Campaign was launched by the Pittsburgh Courier, a prominent Black newspaper in 1942. The campaign came in response uh, to a letter written by a young black man, James G. Thompson, and his letter was titled, Should I Sacrifice to Live Half American? The campaign was very simple. It encouraged the black community to participate in wartime programs uh, and fight for victory abroad against fascism, and also encouraged the black community to fight for victory against Jim Crow racism and fight for social progress at home. The Black newspapers played a crucial role in those goals, and so did Black women. In Cheryl Mullenbach's book, uh, Double Victory, How African American Broke Race and Gender Barriers to Help Win World War II, it's explained that women journalists, uh, or as a women journalist, Elizabeth had the unique opportunity to report in places where men couldn't go. And as a Black journalist, she had a different approach and perspective when it came to journalism compared to her predominantly white and male counterparts. Unfortunately, shortly after she arrived to London, she became ill and was hospitalized. But despite this setback, she continued to write reports from her hospital bed, uh, which I think is crazy the dedication that she had to serving her community and to news and making sure that she was getting news back home, uh, whether it be the names of black soldiers that she met or her experiences adjusting to, to air raids in London. Uh, I think it's very commendable. Uh, in 1960, she became the first woman in Baltimore to serve on the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners, a position she held until uh, 74. And during Elizabeth's tenure on the school board, she helped dismantle segregationist practices uh, in the Baltimore school system that basically hasn't been enforcing the 1954 Brown decision of integration. Uh, an example of this is during a vote for promotion of principals, Elizabeth, Elizabeth refused to vote until black candidates were included in principalships for integrated schools. Uh, at the end of the day, Elizabeth was a journalist. She worked at the Afro as a reporter, an editor, a publisher, a columnist. Her column, If You Ask Me, ran in the Afro for 48 years until her death in 1998. Uh, and If You Ask Me was born 
uh, basically out of a wish that her mother had for her, that there should always uh, be some good news which I definitely relate to with everything that's happening in the world today and what you see on TV or in print news. Uh, it's always good to have a little bit of something positive for us to read and to hold on to. Next, we have Juanita Jackson Mitchell. And I will first say Juanita Jackson Mitchell is the daughter of Lily Carroll Jackson, who I have a picture of both of them here. You have Lily and you have Juanita here. Uh, Lily Carroll Jackson was the Baltimore chapter president of uh, the NAACP from 1935 until basically 1970. Uh, her mother, uh, Lily Carroll Jackson, was a force to be reckoned with when it came to civil rights activism in Baltimore. Uh, and a lot of the work that Juanita did uh, she was able to do it under her mother's guidance. Uh, but Juanita Jackson Mitchell, she was born in Arkansas in 1913. And she was born in Arkansas because her parents, uh, Kiefer Jackson and Lily Carroll Jackson, they would travel across the country, basically showing religious films to black communities during a time where authentic black representation in media was almost non-existent, or, or usually de um, depicted as cruel stereotypes. And just to give some context, uh, Juanita was born uh, two years before Birth of a Nation came out, uh, which was considered America's first blockbuster film, uh, and which is also a wildly racist film as well. So you have a lot of negative media around African Americans during this time, and her parents are traveling, trying to combat those stereotypes. Um, eventually, because it's very hard to travel in Jim Crow America, her family settled back in Baltimore, where her mother was from, and she was educated in Baltimore's public schools. She also graduated from Douglas High School in 1927 at 14 years old. Uh, she received her bachelor's of education in 1931 uh, and her master's in so of sociology in 1935, both from the University of Pennsylvania. And while in graduate school, uh, she led a student demonstration that desegregated the university's dorms. Uh, so she was active in, in protesting and in activism at a very young age. Um, her activism continued inside and outside of a university setting. In 1931, Juanita and her older sister, Virginia, under the guidance of their mother, Lily, founded the Citywide Young People's Forum. This was a youth-led organization and it was probably one of the first of its kind, and it sought out Baltimore's young adults and created an environment where they can talk about the current issues and problems they face, specifically the lack of jobs for African Americans during the Great Depression. Uh, back in December, the BMI hosted a Lunch and Learn about the 1933 Buy Where You Can Work campaign on Pennsylvania Avenue. Feel free to check out that recording on the BMI's YouTube page. The work Juanita did with the Citywide Young People's Forum showed how much potential there was tapping into younger generations for civil rights advocacy. And Walter White, who was the executive secretary of the NAACP at the time, recognized that. And from 1935 to 38, Juanita was uh, the special assistant to Walter White and served as the first national youth director and development developed the organization's youth and college division. Uh, and this back picture that you see here, Juanita is standing with the Scottsboro Boys. Um, and the Scottsboro Boys are basically your Great Depression version of Central Park Five or the Exonerated Five. Uh, feel free to, to Google their story. There's so much there. But she was here on a, as a representative for, for the, the, youth, the NAACP Youth Council. Um, Going back to her educational background, uh, and thanks to the work that Thurgood Marshall did with successfully desegregating the University of Maryland School of Law back in 1935 uh, with the Murray versus Pearson case, Juanita was one of the first Black women to attend, the graduate, attend and graduate from the law school along with Elaine Davis in 1950. And we have a photo of her graduation from the School of Law here on the left. Um, I do want to mention that even after women were admitted to practice law in the state of Maryland, um, the state bar organizations were not as welcoming. We have Rose Zetzer. She was a white woman who graduated from the School of Law at University of Maryland in 1925. And it took her until 1946 to gain admission to the Maryland uh, State Bar Association. 
Maryland was the last state to admit women to the state, state bar association. Uh, and it took women until 1957 to gain membership into the bar association for Baltimore City. So even longer. Uh, but despite these barriers for women, especially for black women, wanted to jump right into the world of law. In 1952, she filed a lawsuit to desegregate the South Beach on uh, the Bay at Sandy Point State Park, which was for whites. The Black section of the area was uh, very neglected, um, and it, it, it wasn't good. But she also had the help of Afro-American newspaper reporters who did investigative work and got information uh, for the case that she was able to use uh, with the help of the NAACP. She also filed a suit for the NAACP to desegregate Fort Smallwood Municipal Park Beach in Anne Arundel County and also swimming pools in Baltimore City. In 1955, which is three years after Juanita took uh, the first step to desegregate Sandy Point Beach, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation at state facilities was unconstitutional. Uh, a U.S. District Court judge earlier ruled that the Supreme Court's uh, Brown versus Board Board of Education decision uh, shouldn't apply, but the Supreme Court upheld the NAAC's point that the 14th Amendment should protect, uh, protections should be extended to state beaches and other recreational facilities, as well as public schools. Juanita, along with Thurgood Marshall and two other Black attorneys uh, with the NAAC, CP filed a lawsuit that integrated the Mergenthaler School of Printing, also known as Mervo, and Western High School. Other notable cases, uh, she served as legal counsel were the Robert Mac Bell versus Maryland case that grew out of the arrest of students attempting to desegregate restaurants in Maryland uh, between 1960 and 1964. She was active, uh, Juanita was active until the 1980s where she suffered a stroke and she died in 1992, um, and she was able to leave a desegregated Baltimore as her legacy. Uh, and over here, I have a photo of uh, the, the Juanita Jackson Mitchell uh, Law Office, which is a, a couple of blocks away from the Lily Carroll Jackson Civil Rights Museum, which also is uh, the former home of her mother. The next woman I'll be talking about is Violet Hill White. Uh, she was born in Washington, D.C. in 1897. She graduated from Douglas High School and Coppin State College. She was an educator and taught for about six years in Frederick County. Uh, in 1937, she became the first African-American police officer in Baltimore City Police Department. When I first looked her up, I'm not going to lie, I was confused. Surely they meant first Black woman Baltimore City Police Officer. Um, uh, Baltimore City Police Department already had issues with hiring women uh, and Black people. Uh, they didn't even hire white women until 1912. So I was very, very surprised that their first Black officer was also a woman. Um, and I think that is just amazing that she was able to have that position. Uh, Violet was assigned to the Northwest District at Pennsylvania Avenue and Dolphin Street by Commissioner William Lawson. Uh, her duties included patrolling the streets. She did homicide investigations, handled narcotic cases and assault, robberies. Uh, and she did a lot of undercover work too, which I think I always think of like top TV shows and going undercover just sounds really uh, mysterious and cool. Uh, I will point out Despite everything that she was doing, she did not have a gun. She was not given a gun. But honestly, I don't think she needed one. Uh, she knew the community, and the community knew her. In addition to working cases, she would collect clothing for inmates and the poor. She made holiday baskets for those who were food insecure, uh, and even stepped in when she saw kids uh, in her area skipping school. Uh, because of her experience as a former school teacher, she was really good uh, and specialized in working with the youth and earned the nickname Lady Law. She once said, uh, being the first at anything is hard because you represent so many others. If you do poorly, everyone will think all those you represent will also do poorly. Um, but she, she definitely set the bar, set the standard uh, for community advocacy work and police work. Um, 
Uh, she worked long hours. Uh, and when she wasn't on duty, she was serving on the board of directors of Provident Hospital. She was also a board member of uh, the former Maryland Safety Council. Uh, and she's, she's quoted like, I'm not afraid of hard work. And she certainly wasn't. Uh, in 1955, she was promoted to the rank of sergeant. And, and in 1967, uh, a couple months before her retirement, uh, Sergeant White was, was promoted to lieutenant. Uh, after she retired from the forest, she became a field work supervisor for Planned Parenthood of Maryland and continued visiting inmates and nursing homes, always bringing toiletries and gifts. Uh, in an interview with the Baltimore Sun, uh, White said, many people told me I wouldn't last as a policewoman, but I kept well and took every job that any man took as a matter of course, except heavy lifting. And she passed away in 1980 at the age of 82. And all of these wonderful pictures here, uh, I was able to pull from the Baltimore Police Historical Society website where they have a page dedicated to her life and the work that she did. So if you're interested in learning more about her, you can go there uh, to start. Uh, and next, uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Irene Morgan. Uh, I don't usually like to assume that someone knows something, but I assume we all know the story of Rosa Parks, or I hope we would. Uh, but just some background information. Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus in 1955 uh, was the spark that ignited the Montgomery bus boycotts. While Rosa Parks is an incredible woman uh, and has an amazing legacy in her own right, she was not the first uh, to protest segregation on a bus or transportation. Uh, again, I mentioned Frances Ellen Watkins Harper who did it with the trolley car 100 years before. Um, but months before Rosa Parks' arrest for refusing to give up her bus seat, you have a 15-year-old Claudette Colvin who was arrested in Montgomery for the same act. Uh, but because she was 15 and pregnant and due to respectability politics, she did not fit the image that the NAACP wanted uh, for this movement. But even before Claudette, basically 10 years before both of these women, you have Irene Morgan. Uh, Irene was born in 1917 in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, growing up, she was in and out of high school. She picked up various jobs like cleaning and doing laundry, providing childcare in order to help support her family through the Great Depression. Um, I already mentioned when we were talking about Juanita, how hard it was for African Americans to find employment during the Great Depression. Everyone is struggling during this time, but especially African Americans who already had barriers to employment and education, even without an economic depression. We're going to fast forward to 1944. Irene is 27. She is a young working mother with two small kids. Uh, she worked at a defense plant that man manufactured B-26 Marauders. Um, and one day, Irene was riding on a Greyhound bus, returning home to Baltimore after visiting her mother in Virginia. She was returning for a doctor's appointment, and she just recently suffered a mis miscarriage. Uh, Irene was sitting in a section of the back of the bus that was designated for black passengers. As the bus made its stops, uh, the white area of the bus got filled. Um, eventually, a white couple boarded the crowded bus and the bus driver ordered Irene to give up her seat. She refused and encouraged the black woman who was sitting beside her, uh, who was carrying a newborn infant at this time, uh, to refuse too. Again, Irene Morgan just had a miscarriage and was physically unable to stand for too long. And the woman beside her had a newborn. It would definitely be difficult to stand on a moving bus while carrying a newborn baby. Uh, Irene's seatmate didn't want any trouble and got up, but Irene continued to refuse the bus driver's demand. The bus driver then drove to the town of Saluda, Virginia, uh, stopped outside of a jail where a sheriff's deputy then boarded the bus with a warrant for Irene's arrest. And she took the warrant, she ripped it up, and she threw it out the window. Uh, the sheriff's deputy then tried to physically remove her off the bus, and she put up a fight. And I quote, he touched me. That's when I kicked him in a very bad place. He hobbled off and another one came on. He was trying to put his hands on me to get off. I was going to bite him, but he was dirty, so I clawed him instead. I ripped his shirt. We were both pulling at each other. 
He said he'd use his nightstick, and I said, we'll whip each other, end quote. Uh, that was a quote from Irene reflecting on her arrest in Carol Morello's The Freedom Fighter, A Nation Nearly For God. And when I read that quote, my mouth dropped open uh, because that that is dangerous during this time. Uh, and that is something that not many people would be brave enough to do. Um, she was jailed for resisting arrest and for violating Virginia segregation law. Her mother had to pay $500 bail to get her out of jail. Uh, and in court, she pleaded guilty to the first charge, which was resisting arrest and paid $100 fine. And she pleaded not guilty to the second charge, which was violating Virginia segregation law. Uh, and she refused to pay the fine for that. And the NAACP took up her case. And with the help of Thurgood Marshall, her case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, this was the first transit case that the NAACP brought before the court, uh, and it was eight years before Brown versus Board of Education. In 1946, the court sided with Morgan in a six to one decision that segregation violated the Constitution's protection of interstate commerce. Uh, so this this case is very interesting because it's not really about civil rights or racism or Jim Crow. It's specifically about interstate com commerce, and they knew that they had to specifically talk about interstate commerce in order to get this passed. Uh, and for the decision, the court wrote, as no state law can reach beyond its own border, no bar transportation of passengers across its boundaries, diverse seating requirements, uh, and interstate journeys result, uh, it seems clear to us that seating arrangements for different races in interstate motor travel require a single uniform rule to promote and protect national travel. Consequently, we hold uh, the, the Virginia statute and, and controversy invalid. Uh, a year after the Morgan decision, you have eight white and eight black activists from the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE, began a two week trip called the Journey of Reconciliation to test this new law. Uh, and they had a chant when they were writing on interstate uh, transportation. When you ride the interstate, oh, sorry, and I quote, when you ride the interstate, Jim Crow is dead. Get on the bus, sit any place, because Irene Morgan won her case. Um, this was the anthem that they sung, trying to spread the word about this Supreme Court decision. Uh, Irene Morgan, uh, she lived her life very quietly afterwards. Uh, and in a Washington Post article in 2000, her daughter talked about her mother's bravery. And I quote, while she never set out to be a hero, her life made a significant impact on the world around her. She didn't see herself as a hero. She saw something that had to be done and rushed in like all heroes. Uh, and with that, I've covered all of the women that I could today. Uh, I'm so excited that I was able to share these names and these legacies with you. And I, I hope you learned a little bit of something. And I hope yeah, you might be inspired to learn more about their legacies yourself or uncover more women uh, who have been left out of the history books. Oh, but I do want to thank the Peel uh, and BNHA for also having this encore presentation uh, of this. I'm, I was glad that I was able to do this twice. Oops. Thank you. Um, let me unmute myself. Hello, everyone. This is Shantae Daniels um, with the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Um, I want to thank the BMI. Baltimore Museum of Industry. I would like to thank the Peel and all of those people in the uh, that work behind the curtain. And I would also like to thank um, Alexis for actually doing this research and bringing these women to the forefront. So many times we um, forget that women did a lot of, of the civil rights work on the back end. Um, collectively, women are extremely strong, we are resilient, and we find a way to um, work collectively in order to make a movement. And in today's world, we are still doing 
great things to move the needle for our young children, for our young adult men, for our young women. And we need to stand up and lead by example as these women did. So I thank you so much for attending this presentation. And for those of you that attended on, um, that had to do a repeat or encore that watched it on Wednesday, um, we're fascinated that you would come back again today. And this um, broadcast will be on, I believe the BMI's YouTube channel. And I'm not sure, I think the Peel is actually going to um, run it on their YouTube. So I appreciate your participation today and your involvement in the program. I would like to welcome you back next month on uh, um, April 28th, 12 noon, same, same time. And we will be talking about why does Baltimore own so many historic buildings? It's a curious question. So that will be part one. And then part two, we'll talk about some of that architecture because Baltimore has 56,000 historic buildings, but we also have a collection of the most eclectic um, architecture in the United States. So I hope that you will join us for that presentation and please look for us on all social media and have a wonderful weekend. Um, I'm not sure about my religious um, recordings, but I will say, I think some people are going into Ramadan, which they may not be here. So uh, good Ramadan, uh, have a wonderful Passover and have a great Easter. And we will see you on April 28th. Thank you again.